Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each episode we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today, we are kicking off our summer season by talking about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, written by Phil Lord, Christopher Miller, and Dave Callahan, directed by Joaquim Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin K. Thompson. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayetos. Hi. Okay, so like I said, we're kicking off our blockbuster summer, summer impossible season where we are going to be covering the entire franchise of Mission Impossible leading up to Dead Reckoning and interspersed with that are super fun summer blockbusters such as Across the Spider-Verse. Uh, so the full schedule is in the show notes and over on our Patreon. There's going to be fun special things just for patrons throughout the summer, like the uh, Discord watch along for Mission Impossible 2 that we're <laughs> going to do for patrons. That's on June 24th, 4 p.m. All the details over on our Patreon. That's going to be fun. Haven't seen that movie in a while. And we'll need to talk about it. It's a movie. <laughs> yeah, <Yes. laughs> sort of. <laughs> okay, but so let's dive into... Across the Spider-Verse. So listeners may remember that in our episode on Into the Spider-Verse, uh, I talked about being a little lukewarm on it and that I kind of enjoyed it, but the animation style was kind of weird for me and the the different frame rates was weird. Uh, so I had some issues with it. I rewatched it before going into this and the third time was the charm and suddenly everything clicked mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, this movie is wonderful and Yay! the visual style is great. I can do it. Maybe it's because I watched Avatar The Last Airbender and now I can handle animation. I don't know. <laughs> but it was a really great experience. Uh, and I'm glad I was able to make that transition so that I could go into this movie with enthusiasm uh, and have that enthusiasm sustain from start to finish because this movie is amazing. Yeah. And I was blown away uh, by everything about this movie. The visuals are stunning. The music is great. The characters are great. The writing is great. The theme is really interesting. It's just really good. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really happy that we're kicking off uh, our summer season of this movie because there's so much to talk about. I really, really loved it. And I want to hear from you guys what you thought. Uh, Alex, tell me about Across the Spider-Verse. Yeah, I mean, I saw this movie twice this weekend uh, because after the first viewing, I just felt like I need to see that again. That was just such an amazing, mind exploding, wonderful experience. And I just need to like see it again to take it all in because it's so dense with just everything. Um, it, and when I first started watching the movie the first time, it was almost too dense. Like I, I was actually worried at the beginning because there was that initial fight scene with the renaissance <laughs> culture like right. you know that and then even you know miles miles morales's first fight with spot it's it's so mm -hmm. fast there's so much banter happening it's so uh, like he leaves in the middle of it <laughs> yeah it, there's so much happening so fast i'm like am i too old like i think i'm too old for this movie I, like my brain hasn't been programmed like on the right you know apps to like take this in but pretty quickly, the movie did settle in to these more emotional character scenes. And, and I never felt that way again you know, through the entire second half of the final act. I never felt that just like too much disorientation. I was just kind of like locked in for this ride. And it just feels like magic to me. I mean, I think just, just because I don't under understand how you do this, it just feels like complete magic. And it's really wonderful to go see a movie, having seen so many movies and made movies where you you always feel like you you understand somewhat how things are done. Uh, this is just like starting over again from zero. I don't understand how any of this was done. Mm. But the fact that it all culminates in such like a rich, rewarding finale that is also a to be continued that is like makes me want so much more. I don't know. It just felt like a magic movie that brought me back to kind of a childhood state of mind of I don't understand how this magic happened, but it's amazing and I want to just keep experiencing the magic. So I loved it. Yeah. 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 Cool. Trisha, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I think this movie's really good. Like, I love, love Into the Spider Verse. And um, I was very hyped for this movie. And then, but I was worried because I was like, how could it be anywhere close to as good? as what is in my mind, basically a perfect movie. Like 
I just was like, how do you do it again? How in the world could you do it again up to par? Um, and not just do it again, because I feel like that's kind of like the marching orders people give to people making sequels. But like what I want from a sequel is expand it, like deepen the themes, like push the characters and then give me m like more innovation and like do something different in a way that I don't expect, but feels like it dovetails in with the direction that the characters were going and with the like, in the case of this, the like stylistic and, um, you know, I, I mentioned on our Into the Spider-Verse episode that that's the case of a movie where the form is also doing theme, right? Where the very like act of the different animation styles of the different spider people and the plot and the structure is also like very, very um, uh, linked or just themed to the core, basically. Um, and I was like, I want this to be up to that standard. The standard is so high. And I am just so impressed that they pulled it off. Like they did exactly what I'm talking about, where they made a movie that is not about the same things thematically. It's an extension and like it, it carries those themes forward into like sort of a natural progression of what that conversation was that began in Into the Spider-Verse is now in Across the Spider-Verse. And all of the things in terms of the technology and the animation and the character development and all of it is the humor and the pacing and like all of it is being pushed forward. And I just cannot believe they did it. And they did it fairly quickly like in terms in movie terms of but the amount of time between into the spider verse when it came out and this movie it's actually pretty quick to have that was the other thing that worried me i was like if they had given this movie to me like 6 8 years later i would be like yes great i feel like you have spent the time that you might need but i'm like this is only a few years later is it really are we really ready it is six years, right? To be fair, because I think 2017 came out in 2018. 2018, okay. Yeah. And it was at the end of 2018, wasn't it? It was like a December, I think. I, believe so. I could be wrong. And they also were making two movies at once because they were also right. making Beyond the Spider Verse. <laughs> yeah, which comes out in like nine months, apparently. <laughs> Listen, I, I am not in animation. I just assume that I this kind of work, at least on the technology side and on the story development side, I assume takes lots and lots and lots of time because the thing about this movie across the spider verse is that the care is in every single tiny pixel and every, like every single little bit of every frame is like hyper engineered to be perfect and deliberate. And the, you know, the sound mix, I read an article about the sound mix being like really, really precise and all of the different, the amount of spider people that there are in this movie and like the differences in animation and all the Easter eggs, which there are so many. And it's just like, there's so much jammed in here and how could you do it um, even in this short amount of time? And they just really, really did. Anyway, I was giggling from the very first, you know, couple minutes of this in the theater. And I was sitting with like a bunch of uh, Gen Z on one side of me. There was a huge group of young people on one side of me who were vocally reacting to everything very, very loudly. And I was kind of like, this is perfect. And then on the other side of me, I had was sitting with my buddy Chase, who didn't say anything the entire movie. And I was very sure that he maybe hated it. But then we walked out <laughs> and he was like, no, that, that was amazing. But he was just, you know, taking it all in. I think both are correct ways to watch this movie. If it knocks you over and you can't speak, I think that that is right. <laughs> and if you need to gasp and laugh and uh, yell at the screen a lot, I think that's also correct. So, yeah, no, absolutely. All right, Brian, what about you? Yeah, you know, it's funny as, as both Trish and Alex were talking, I was thinking about um, I've been playing the new Legend of Zelda game. And I think that game and this movie, there's just this thing in me going like, how did humans do this? Like, how yeah. is this possible? Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this movie was 
you know, more of the same usually is used as a negative, <laughs> but sometimes you're like, I, that's exactly what I want is more of the same. Um, and obviously more than more of the same, but in terms of if you loved Into the Spider-Verse, you are going to get that. They're not taking some weird, crazy left turn, right? Um, and yeah, the first 20 minutes or so, I was just, I was basically like tearing up at how good it was, you know, yeah. just that sort of like... We talked about the first movie and Fury Road and Scott Pilgrim of just being like, just like, here's sort of straight entertainment being tapped to your veins and Jason Schwartzman's the bad guy. Um, and <laughs> um, and the funny thing is, was going in knowing that it was going to be the first half of a movie. Uh, and I had seen people say like, yes, that's what you should be expecting. It's the first half movie. And I was like, okay. So then when the spot is getting his power at that final collider, um, I was like, oh, okay, maybe this is it. Like maybe we're going to do kind of an 85 minute tease of a first half of a movie. Um, and we're going to end on the Matrix Reloaded, Deathly Hallows Part 1, Infinity War ending, where it's like the villain has all their power now, cut to black, you know, stay tuned for next year. Um, and then they were like, oh, wait, there's more um, because the movie looked like it was going to end. And then they said, uh, uh, and then they go into this whole bonkers, like tragedy, your tragedy is canon and you can't break it. And it happens in all the multiverses and et cetera. Right. Which obviously we'll get into all that separately from, from me blabbering right now. Um, and I was like, okay, this is interesting. And then now miles has to escape because he wants to, you know, he wants to not listen to the Oracle basically and, and go off and, and, tr and try to make his own fate. And then I was like, all right, when he escapes, then that's going to be the big ending. And like, yeah, like he's out and now he's on his own and cut to black. And the movie was like telling me like, all right, here it is. And, but there's more. And then the movie kept going. And now it's uh, he's in the wrong universe. And now we have to deal with this. And, and uh, unfortunately, I kind of went, I, this is one too many things for me right now, at least on first viewing. You know, I think I think it's only a first viewing problem. And, and when I see it again, I will not feel that way because I'll know where it's going. But I was just like, oh, man, you had me with this like wrench in the works and then you're like but now here's the new one based on the new information you got a few minutes ago now here's our extra plot twist that we're doing um and uh so so it just was a lot to hold in my head um but the upside of that is like i have no idea what the next movie is going to be like how are they how and in what order are they going to close all of these threads that are now open mm. right and so you, you know someone used the word dense where it's just like man there's oh, so yeah. much going on here now where i'm just excited for the next movie because i'm just excited to see what they do with all of this stuff that they've they've put out there now yeah yeah it's really interesting you mentioned uh, your experience of those endings, because for me, I had totally forgotten that this was mm. like a, a first half of like a two I didn't know it whatsoever. Right. Yeah. Like I, I, I think I'd read like an announcement way back when that they were doing that, but um, I'd totally forgotten. And for me, it, it, it felt like we were heading towards the finale. Like I felt like there were, we were heading towards a showdown with, you know, it, was, it felt like a three hour movie basically. And we were like yeah. heading into act three. Um, and so I was actually just like loving it. I loved all these twists and builds up. And I feel like we were going to do a three hour movie and we're heading into act three now. And that's when to be continued came up on the screen. Uh, so I'm, I'm just glad I'm glad that I wasn't like counting the endings or waiting for an ending. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think there's an interesting marketing thing that happened with this because I had seen the initial title was Across the Spider-Verse Part 1. Mm -hmm. And so I was mm. fully ready. But I think I was the only person in my theater that was fully ready. Like, Oh, yeah, people reacted. <laughs> oh, the, the Gen Zs that were on my left were irate. <laughs> like, <laughs> they were ready to throw things. I mean, it was just like, I think... It's so interesting that, you know, okay, I fully admit that I I wasn't, I was trying not to see marketing for it because I w really wanted to go in and be surprised, but clearly they didn't do a good job of, uh, of adjusting people's expectations to this being a part one, unlike something like Dune or perhaps Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning part one, <laughs> right. um, which we will talk about. And um, I think that that's a really interesting problem question mark open question uh that this movie has it's a feature or is yeah. it a bug let's talk about uh -huh. it well yeah i feel like this goes into like a, a structure it's conversation a bug. sorry <laughs> no <laughs> wow we wow 
or a bug, uh, a feature about a bug man. All right, Michael, you talk. You're fired. <laughs> yeah, bye everyone. <laughs> Yeah, well, and so so I think it, I mean, there's so many things to celebrate about this movie. I feel like it's interesting that we're sort of starting off with like the one of the couple bumps, the bumps maybe. Yeah. Um, and and I think the structure of this movie is really interesting. And so as we're talking about sort of your expectations going into this, I think affected how you received all the ebb and flow of the the story. And so I think for me. Uh, because I didn't know it was a part one, as I was watching the movie, I had this feeling of this is a very long act one. Like mm. we've been in act one for like 40, 50 minutes here. Like this is a really long act one. I was loving it. I was really enjoying all the character work that it let them do and build up the relationship with Miles and his parents even more. We get that great scene where he and Gwen hang out and I feel like I'm a kid again. And they're like hanging upside down our ponytail. And it's just like, it's too good. Uh, and so there's so much character work, theme work getting set up. Uh, and so I really loved that it was taking its time. But I was also like, we've been here so long. This has got to be a three hour movie. I should have looked at the runtime before I like got into this. And then it gets into the the second act, which uh, is the really fun. Uh, starts with the detour to the the Mumbai city. But I forget the name of it. Mumbatten. Mumbatten. <laughs> yes, thank yeah. you. So we do that. And then we get to Spider Headquarters. And then it felt like the movie was going really fast. Like, I feel like when you enter Spider headquarters to when you realize they're actually the bad guys, essentially, mm -hmm. felt like a really fast sequence, especially as compared to the first act. And so then it gets to the, what is essentially the, the third act. And it was this weird situation where I was like, I can't quite tell, is it like, are we getting ready for like a dark night and one more act to like another 20, 30 minutes? Cause I think I'm ready for that. And then part one hit the screen and I was like, Oh, Oh, Oh. And so I think that that leads to a lot of interesting questions about what can come next, but also how do you structure and pace a film that is a part one? Uh, and as you're talking about Trisha, how do you set those expectations properly for the audience when they're going into it? Well, I don't have an answer to that second question because um, <laughs> I'm not in marketing. Uh, but I think we were talking about this on the Discord. And we sort of identified potentially two areas um, of like things that can you can resolve. Um, and so we were talking about character arc and theme and in that kind of like that dimension of story. And then we were also talking about just like a plot things, because I think some of the best part twos in the world resolve a character arc question or a thematic question in a beautiful way while leaving plot that threads unresolved. Part two in this of, situation. Of a, three, meaning, of a three part series. Or yeah. of uh, any continuation. So, or okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So like a middle Act, a middle chapter. Want, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and so we were talking about, you know, something like Two Towers, which does that, I think. It has this sort of thematic arc for at least some of the characters and then it resolves that and then it moves on. But there's like so much plot that's unresolved, right? The ring hasn't gone anywhere mm -hmm. near Mordor yet. Mm -hmm. And there are all of these other open questions that need to be resolved in terms of plot. Um, and so, but there's a sense of satisfaction um, and even something like Empire Strikes Back has a, the end of a character journey, right? You know, finally Princess Leia confesses her feelings and Han Solo knows already. But <laughs> that's an expression of a closure right. um, in terms of character arc or theme, something like that. And Luke isn't done with his training and he goes to face Darth Vader and he totally fails. But that's still the resolution of a, a character question. Um while, again, there are so many plot threads that are being not resolved. And so as we were discussing this, you know, we ranged from Dune and then we, you know, talked about um, Endgame and Infinity War and where they sort of fall on this spectrum. And so I, I wanted to but haven't yet made like a... I think it's called a matrix graph or like chart that has basically an X, Y axis, right? And so you have like resolved plot and character theme, like in the north, south, and then you have like plot things on the east, west, and then you can 
put your dots in there of all the different things that you can do. So I'm still planning to make that, but I do think this falls somewhere in a, in a range that I feel comfortable in. I think that there are, you know, at the very extreme ends of some of those axes, you're probably going to feel pretty uncomfortable um, mm -hmm. or in the far corners, I guess, of that graph, you would probably feel pretty uncomfortable. But I feel like in this case, there are things that are very much resolved, particularly in Gwen's arc, right? Her mm -hmm. arc is basically this entire movie. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very resolved in terms of character, in terms of theme for her. And so I think that's what kind of makes this feel like a complete meal. Well, again, there are so many plot threads that are being unresolved. And I do think there are open thematic questions that have yet to be answered. It's not Absolutely. like it does everything. Yeah. But I do think it engages with enough of those things that kind of makes it, I don't know, into a little package. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right on with the Gwen Stacy thing. Because I was, I was thinking about it, you know, oftentimes, you, you know, think about Matrix Reloaded. You know, when that cut to to be continued, it felt pretty weird. You know, it was mm. like the, the the image we ended on is not what I would expect. And I don't really know where the characters are or what arcs got resolved before we smash cut to real life Agent Smith. And in this <laughs> movie, I, I felt both like I felt kind of an exhilaration when I said to be continued and it and not a sense of like I was cheated or a sense that, oh, that wasn't enough of a movie to be the full movie. And I think it's really all because of Gwen Stacy and because this movie, I think really smartly kind of begins and ends with her. Mm -hmm. So we feel like it's kind of, that is a complete movie with her arc, with her dad. It ends with her kind of turning her goals in a new direction, which is she's no longer kind of aligning herself with these like foster parents that took her in. You know, she kind of, left her dad who had rejected her fell in with this new group that accepted her uh kind of didn't question their mission now has reconciled with her dad and is going her own way and is going to do her own thing um and i think that is a very satisfying conclusion even though everything else is still up in the air mm -hmm. that was a very smart choice on their part to bookend the movie with her because if it was yeah just very miles focused and we don't have the Gwen Stacy father, daughter, you know, her kind of leaving and coming back, then it would feel maybe a little bit more like the Matrix Reloaded ending of just like, you know, reveal dark side miles mm. and, you know, put your finger to the thing to like break out and then we cut the black. That would be like a little bit of that cut the black on Agent Smith. Mm. Yeah, you know, they almost they almost could have gone even farther if they wanted to, which I'm glad they didn't, um, into... Like I was thinking how you like Marvelize this as an MCU Marvel, not Spider-Man, which obviously is Marvel, but um, it, where it's like you just be like, OK, let's replace the spot or, or let's capture him. He's done this movie and then we're going to have another movie, another villain for the next movie. And then Gwen has her kind of ending her complete arc. And then wrong universe miles is like a post credit scene or something like that. Right. So you could, even, you could like really try to make that right. I'm not <laughs> saying they should do this. I'm saying that you could have really tried to make this be a standalone movie. Right. But right. that was not what they were intending. So I think we're talking about two different things. One of which is the movie itself and the other, of which is the sort of marketing surrounding the movie. Right. And, and right. we can stop talking about all this cause we want to get into the actual movie. But, um, but I do think it's a, it's probably a studio thing to say, don't call it part one because then people won't go see it. They'll wait till part two is out. They'll watch it at home, da, da, da. And because it was going to be called part one and for some reason it was changed, right? So we don't know why that is. Um, and so maybe that's the right money move or whatever, but I think it's the wrong expectation move to then not tell your audience coming into your movie, this is the first half of a, of a, of a bigger story, right? Um, now, that doesn't mean the movie itself should be any different. <laughs> I just wish, I, I, I do wish for people who didn't know that this was the first half of a movie that... It, that that intention was clear. It's almost the opposite of what Dune did. Dune was called Dune until you sat in the seats and it said Dune, part one. You're like, oh, okay. And so then when it doesn't end, you're like, okay, I know what I'm into. This movie sort of, they went from calling it part one to burying that fact. And then and then I, I, I hope <laughs> I hope people are excited to see the third movie, even if they were disappointed by the ending of this movie. But, uh, but yeah, I just think it's an interesting conversation. But I think ironically, 
uh, you may have had a negative experience. It sounded like knowing it was part one and kind of anticipating the like bracing for the cutoff. And I actually love that I didn't. Right. Well, because the movie kept going. It. Yeah. Dad, 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 look at this shot. And <laughs> right. here's a new scene. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So expe- expectations are so hard. It's like, Definitely. what is, yeah, yeah. you can't guarantee what's going to be better. And, and right. it's interesting because I think, yeah, the surprise to be continued in this movie for me was just like almost exhilaration and excitement because I got so much and I was so right. satisfied. And I, wait, oh, I get more. I forgot about that. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. 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 It, yeah, it is interesting because I didn't have that feeling. It felt a little bit like pulling the rug out from under me and partially because it felt like I don't, from everything that was set up in that moment, I was like, I don't need another two hours to resolve what's here. Like, I think another 20, 30 minutes could have done it. The more I thought about that, I am revised that statement, but it also has made me think about the Gwen Stacy character and her role in, in this. And so I think it'd be fun to dive into the sort of dual protagonist almost e thing that they have yeah. going on where like the movie starts with her and we have a big chunk of her and setting up, you know, we get to see exactly what happened with her Peter and her dad, like we're talking about. And so it sets up her wound ghost backstory, all that stuff. Her world is gorgeous. I oh want my to God. live there. It's just <laughs> so how dare you animators exactly it's so it's the colors beautiful. the the yeah. color palettes in this movie are just yeah. so pleasurable to look <laughs> at it moves with the emotion of the oh, scene like when she so reunites gorgeous. with her dad and then yeah. you know that starts like streaking like, color the watercolors yeah. oh, oh, i was crying like i was just yeah. weeping yeah it was, and the music as you guys have said which is obviously the other uh, side yeah. of this which is so just, good like, every every track sounds like the perfect thing to i was reading a bunch of reviews of this today and just Dazzling is the word that everybody keeps using. Mm. Truly dazzling. Yes. Yes. How do they yeah, <laughs> start to finish? Yeah. <laughs> but so so yeah, there's this big setup with Gwen that kind of made me be like, oh, this is Gwen's movie, maybe. Okay, cool. Because it feels like it's setting that up. And then it isn't. It's Miles's movie, and we do get to see Gwen go on an arc, but we're sort of seeing it through Miles's eyes or sort of watching her react to things like there was part of me that wished we had gone on the journey from her perspective a little bit but i was okay with that and like kind of into it and that was actually in that moment when it cut to to be continued i was like oh the next movie will be hers okay awesome but then i realized no kind of to your point alex we just resolved her arc so the thing that i was kind of excited for for her we actually kind of already did and it sort of happened in the background and it still paid off and it was still emotional and still thematically resonant. And then the thing that I was thinking in the moment, which was just like, oh, yeah, Miles is done. Now he's realized the error of his ways and act three will be about him, you know, having to choose what's right now that he's seen exactly how bad things can be, blah, blah, blah. I'm now realizing this that is actually a great midpoint for him where now he has seen the truth and he can no longer ignore that, like, uh, which is such a, an interesting, like, thematic place to dive this deep with with, is as a superhero as spider-man as spider pig says right like the toughest part of this job is that you can't save everyone and what is individualism and selfish self-actualization who pays the cost of that somewhere else like i think those are really interesting things to get into and so cutting it off where it is that is kind of a midpoint where now miles is face to face with that truth he can't ignore it the way he's been. And so there's a lot to uh, arrive at there. So it was just really interesting the way the structure happened and not knowing it was a part one, I had to kind of reverse put together what was actually happening. Uh, And I did not enjoy any of it. It was just a very disorienting experience because at first it felt like, oh, I don't need another part to, to finish this movie. Yeah, there's a POV thing that this movie has the prologue is what I'm going to call it with Gwen and and the Da Vinci <laughs> hawk. What is his name? Vulture. 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 Thank you. Um, which I just love. I just love all of it. Uh, it's so funny and great. But um, you know, I was so sure that we were going to stay in her POV, mm-hmm. and we don't. We just lose her for like it, and it's a long. Like I think it really does in 
in the total runtime of part one and part two together, maybe that 30 minute, 35, 40 minute, I didn't time it, that chunk that is from her POV, perhaps it is, it's not that long, but perhaps it, it does serve as an actual prologue. Maybe it's short enough to really serve as an actual prologue. Um, and then we switch into Miles's perspective. Um, and so you can kind of leave it over there. But there, the problem is the writing is so good. <laughs> and the performances, <laughs> the vocal performances are so good. And as you're pointing out, the animation is so evocative and the themes are so strong, right? Like there's this sense of what if I'm not accepted for who I am by my family? And then it happens. The, her worst fear happens right there in the opening, like, you know, a little Just act, a mini yeah. act of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she is instantly rejected by her dad. Um, and then it, you know, the all of that is just so emotional. That core is right there in front of you that I it's so hard for me to then set it aside and be like, well, that was a fun prologue. Anyway, what's up miles up to? Um, <laughs> it just it didn't work that well for me where I started to really miss what was going on from Gwen's perspective. And then there's so much secrecy, right? Then they, they right. use the POV switch to control information and hide a bunch of information from us and from Miles. And I just missed being in Gwen's head. Now, to be fair, the series, well, I say the series, but uh, the Into the Spider-Verse does this, right? It, it has these like sort of mini expository sequences and scenes all the time. And the secondary um, protagonist of Into the Spider-Verse is, you know, the Peter B. Parker character. And we have a decent amount that's like kind of from his perspective also, um, but not to the extent there. And so I, I don't think there's something wrong with it. I'm not trying to solve it necessarily, but just that if you're bumping on it, I think that there's a legitimate reason why. It's because you're in someone else's head now and they're doing it on purpose to you to hide a bunch of stuff from you and make the story about Miles, which up until that point, it suggested it was about Gwen. Mm -hmm. um, and the resolution, while among the more gorgeous things I've ever looked at in my whole life, mm -hmm. um, to her plot, is also so good. It's like, if you didn't want me to be like wanting this to be Gwen's movie from start to finish, then be a little less good at it. Um, <laughs> because unfortunately, that's all I want. Now, you know, again, there's so much else in here that is uh, praiseworthy and works. And like, it just feels, I think the sense of the density and like, is this two different movies feeling torn in different directions, feeling like it can't all possibly be resolved. It's too much. It's not just the sensory overload. There's a very real story reason where the story seems like split all the way down um, between Miles and Gwen. Yeah, I, I definitely also felt like I was like I was loving the Gwen segment so much that it was like when it went to, to Miles, it was like I wasn't disappointed as much as I was like, but that was so good. Like I, I was happy to just keep going there. Right. Yeah. But also that's, you know, that is what the first movie established this thing to be. It's like we have plenty of Spider-Man movies that are about one Spider-Man. Even No Way Home is really right. about Tom Holland's Spider-Man. He just there's these two very strong supporting characters, obviously. And Spider-Verse is like, no, this is a movie about <laughs> many spider Everyone. people, right? Um so, but it is almost cheating to be like here's like the best the best Gwen opening we could possibly do. And then now you've got to like here's a bunch of other characters you got to go pay attention to. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for me, I didn't feel it felt it felt okay to me. Like the the dual protagonist feeling of the movie, I I really appreciated going to Miles' world, being in his head, then having his perspective and his you know the amount of information he has access to for the part of the movie that we we don't know where she's been off you know doing the Spider Squad stuff. She knows the truth about him. I, it all felt really smart where we we get to establish her kind of inciting core incident that drives her to join that team. And then by the end of the movie, she is 
she's yeah breaking with that family. She's found acceptance in her original family and now is kind of freed to make up her own mind and choose her own way because she's no longer relying on that like secondary family to kind of, you know, I can't go against them because my own dad didn't accept me. Um, so I agree. I mean, I would like I'm down for like four of these movies um, and you could just do, you know, all the Gwen Stacy. Uh, but I think in this movie, I don't know, it, it, it all worked for me really well. And I think I think the ending brought it all together for me. There was something that was just so it, it did. It did the, the Dark Knight ending thing or whatever, where you just you just feel like uh, in that final montage of, you know, her with her dad making the choice to kind of like open up the portal and gather the team. You've got Miles face to face with his doppelganger from the alternate universe. You've got uh, what's what's his name? Oscar Isaac's character. Uh, Miguel. Miguel and that team are getting ready. Spot is arriving in the original universe. It, it just all landed so well that I, I just it, it, the whole package felt so expertly constructed. I wouldn't want to like pull too many threads on it or mm -hmm. try to like, yeah, like you said, Trisha, then try to fix it because where it landed for me at least just was just so perfect. Um, so anyway, yeah, not just agreeing with your points, but it all worked for me. And I, I didn't even like kind of consider like that, that we should have been with Gwen for more of the movie. Cause it just mm. felt like mm -hmm. we needed to not be with her for the arc of the story as it mm. played out. Yeah. Well, and again, I mean, I think, I think this happens a lot when we talk about a movie that's like near perfect and the <laughs> fact is like so like well we could we could gush about yeah. it for forever or <laughs> I said but gushing it, for an hour. Yeah. But I do think it's interesting to in in these moments where like this movie clearly all worked for all of us. This is the most fun I've had in the movie theater in like very, very long time. Right. To examine those things that like, but why did that feel weird? Because I think it can also like that's illuminating. And I think there are as we were talking about just sort of formal structure things that it's interesting to think about as you were pointing out, Trisha, that the Gwen opening is like too good. And I think it's too long. I'm not, it's, I'm not going to say too long. It's longer than it would be in a different movie if it wasn't a right. part one. So it feels the right, sort of formal right. elements are sending different signals. And so if you're tuned to that, you're like, well, this isn't a prologue. This is something else. This is like the first act of like a protagonist story. Uh, and so it's just interesting to examine the side effects of when when those dials even get shifted right. by a couple minutes, the kind of ripple effects that can can happen from those. And speaking of elements that are too good, let's talk about Spot. Can we for a minute, please? <laughs> uh, because I think he's too interesting of a villain. I don't know, like everything about him really works for me, but then he vanishes for half of this movie. Like he legitimately just disappears for half mm -hmm. of this movie. Um, but there's so much about him that's so fascinating and not just the like weirdness of his powers that totally breaks my brain and I have bad <laughs> spatial reasoning and this is my nightmare. Play portal, Trisha. I yeah. have watched people play portal a lot <laughs> and I didn't understand it any better. Um, but yeah, there's, there's that, but then his sort of, Jason Schwartzman manages to make more of that character than there really, like, is, I think, maybe on the page. Again, going back to being too good. Mm -hmm. But just, like, it seems like he's, A, really funny and fun to watch, everything that he does. And partially because the animation is fun, partially because Jason Schwartzman's performance is so fun. But then there's also this, like, real gravity to him. Um, there's this true, like, nihilism to it. Um, this movie really does thematically remind me of everything everywhere all at once, right? Where like Spot mm. is basically an everything bagel. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> of nihilism. Um, <laughs> and, Full of holes. <laughs> <laughs> truly. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it becomes sort of this like, yeah, question, I guess, for the protagonist of his relationship to this concept. I've never like missed a Spider-Man villain. And it's so funny that they're like the villain of the week over here. Well, maybe Alfred Molina. Um, but like, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> he was maybe the best. Yeah. Um, but they're like, they, you know, they, they make a point of saying like, don't worry about this villain over here. He's nothing. And then as the story goes along, he's more and more and more, but then he's gone. He was hit by a bagel too. 
because that, yeah, that's the he record. was hit by a bagel. Hey, okay. There's a lot Origin of multiverse story. stuff happening yeah. here. Um, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, there's just part of the you're talking about how your body is receiving different signals structurally if you're like attuned to structure, and I think that that's part of where it comes in. It's like I haven't seen Spot in such a long time mm-hmm. that that even if I had no idea there was a part two coming, I'd be like. Nope, we're not going to get back to him soon enough because he's too interesting to wrap up his plot line in two minutes or five minutes or ten, right? He's too interesting. So we have to have half an hour at least. Like he's, you know, a Thanos level villain for sure. And so we're going to have to take half a movie to do it. And we don't have half a movie left. And so again, it's just this sense of, what you what you can tell by just being an, uh, a savvy moviegoer at mm-hmm. this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting villain because the way he's introduced, I sort of expected it to be like a, this is going to be a five minute scene where we catch this Same. guy, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because he was so sort of comical and goofy in, in, in the way it was. And that's kind of his thing a little bit, right? Is he's like, I'm not, like he literally says, I'm not just a villain of the week. Um, and uh, so then it was like once it started, once they started doubling down on him a little bit, I was like, OK, I guess I need to really settle into this villain, um, which was fine. But then I was also starting to go, yeah, but I also don't care a lot of times in these movies about the villain as much as I care about everything else going on. Right. So I I didn't my, I like agree with everything you're saying, Trisha, but I also was like, I'm happy to not be in spot territory right now because I want to see what the hell's going on with miles and, and this whole crazy spider compound, you know, situation and all that kind of stuff. Um, so for me, it was the, it was like a good amount of, we're going to introduce this guy and we're going to get you interested in him, but also he's going to take off so we can focus on a bunch of other character stuff. And then we have a whole other movie to, to really kind of dig into him. Mm. Because I, I really liked Miguel as sub antagonist. Right. Definitely. He, he was somebody that I was actually more interested in than, than Spot. So I was actually really pleased when all those turns happened at the Spider Society, whatever that's called, the giant building with spider men, yeah. women, everybody, <laughs> horses, T Rexes. Um, yeah. And, and that, that was where I really leaned forward was when, yeah, they mm. got into those, you know. Also, too good of an antagonist. Right. Yeah. And, and then and then and the whole and getting into those themes that I think are floating around a lot nowadays of just, you know, uh, if we can predict the future, how do you respond to that? How do you how do you act if, you know, if we can say if you do this, it's going to re- lead to this bigger problem, but it's your dad or it's your loved one. Mm-hmm. That that ethical dilemma, I think, is maybe because of AI or just like the way our world's we feel like we're machines and we're predictable. I I think it's just a really interesting theme. Westworld did a lot of this that is just floating around out there. And, and I, I loved how they took that thing from the ether and applied it to the Spider-Man lore, which is so based on, you know, specific inciting incident kind of tragedies as, as character defining. Right. Um, And, and it, you know, this movie is doing, we mentioned the the other day on a, the Speed uh, Patreon exclusive podcast. I mentioned a video essay by Thomas Flight about meta modernism in movies, and the idea, and everything everywhere where all at once is, was his prime example of a meta modern movie. And I think one thing this movie it feels very similar to everything everywhere all at once in a lot of ways, you know, mm-hmm. including the metaverse stuff. But it's also exploring its own mythology, its own lore. It's 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 basically going back through that and like, what does it mean to say with your mythology that it's it's important to have a really bad tragedy to create a hero, you know, to have a loved one die violently to create Spider-Man? Like, does Spider-Man need that to be Spider-Man? Can Spider-Man be motivated by things other than deep, dark, you know, family tragedy or, you know, captain dying tragedy. And I think that's really exciting because now it's the next movie is going to kind of answer that or explore that uh, meta question about the franchise and about superhero stories and the Spider-Man specific mythology. Yeah, we're we're in such a weird place. I'm going to be fascinated like 20 years from now to look back at this this time right now where 
you know, I was going to bring up that video too. It's uh, Thomas Flight. I think it's it's called like meta, meta modernism or something, as as you said. Um, I forget what the actual title is, but so I think it's like why do movies feel different now, right? <laughs> or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and sort of you know, Matrix Resurrections and Everything Everywhere All at Once and Spider Man No Way Home and Across the Spider Verse. They're all these movies that are about themselves right like they're sort of these recursive kind of we know you know what movies are so now let's talk about that and let's kind of go and we are literally stepping into a multiverse in in a lot of these in like every superhero genre now um and so if no way home is saying what if all the spider-man movies you saw over the past 20 years were all part of the same shared multiverse and all these characters could actually come together and meet each other and like talk about their shared stories and stuff. Then now across the spider verse is the next part of the conversation, which is what if this, these sort of tropes that happen in superhero movies are a necessary canon that, that can't be broken. Right. And it's, it's interesting. It's like, for better or for worse, franchises are getting to a point where they're, they're raising the question, like, is it better to make a make the next movie just be a commentary on it? it like, itself on this franchise right on wh where we are now or should they be pushing for just brand new stories here's something that's nothing like you've ever seen before or should a franchise check out when it's getting to that point where it's like well if, if the next movie is just going to be about the other movies then maybe we shouldn't keep making that right <laughs> and this is but this movie's so good that it's just sort of like right. i don't know do everything <laughs> and then make it just do it all really well stay tuned for our indiana jones and mission impossible episodes coming <laughs> right. up on the new installments in those franchises right yeah, well, it's kind of, it's so fortuitous, I guess, that, that Spider-Man as an IP seems so extremely well positioned to be exploring mm -hmm. this right now because we've, because of kind of all the weird decision making that has happened over the past <laughs> 20 years that gave us too many Spider-Men too quickly right. together that it can lean into this, but also just the character mm -hmm. of Spider-Man and also the character of Miles Morales like I think that's what's so fascinating is this movie has that meta thing where we're literally talking about canon events and anomalies and like we're being very literal about the meta-ness uh where it's like you gotta have this canon event that's canon that's what comics are blah 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 but it's also tied to character and character journey and Miles Morales as I, I remember my friend Steve telling me when you hear they're the, like they're gonna make a new like Marvel. I hope they do Miles Morales story. I'm like, who's that? He's oh, he's this like mixed race kid from Brooklyn, and he's the new Spider Man. I was like, what? That's not what Spider Man is. Spider Man is X Y Z, blah blah blah. But that's so cool. And look at what it's become. And so I think there's also like Miles as not the normal Spider Man, and that being his character journey just dovetails so nicely with all of this other stuff happening, such that it's. He can ask that question just as a human, right? Like, do I, can I wear the suit? Can I be Spider-Man if I'm not all these other preconceived notions of what is required to be a Spider-Man? Like that can touch political things and go as high or low as you want, but it's still rooted in like a character and a teenage kid and just like the spirit of what you go to a Spider-Man movie for. And I feel like that's like the, the story design magic of this movie for me is that it's doing all of these things, but it's still super personal and just about the characters. And it doesn't feel like it's bending one way or the other to hit other things to me anyway. Yeah, I very much agree. I think that when we were talking about uh, Into the Spider-Verse, we talked about the youth of Spider-Man and how that's a key part of the character. And like, even though we have some spider people in this and in the previous, you know, in, in Into the Spider-Verse, we have some older spider people. Um, but we talked talk about how the origin of the character that sets Spider-Man apart from other superheroes is his youth, his optimism and his naivety and how that works well and makes the character relatable and humanizes the character. And this very much is still a coming of age story in a lot of ways. It feels almost like a graduation story. Um, I volunteer with youth and it's June. So I've been going to a lot of grad parties and talking to high school graduates and just people who are at the end of formal schooling and on the verge of adulthood. 
And there's very much that sense in this movie um, of in order to feel like ready to tackle the world in like a new chapter of life, especially as an adult, if you're moving from youth into adulthood, you need like a sense of affirmation from the place that you come from and then a sense of like sending. So it's like, we see you, we know who you are, you are enough, you are what the world needs and go out into the world, we give you our blessing, right? Like that's kind of what this ritual is about. And basically every culture has a coming of age ritual. You know, here we associate it with graduation, um, but it, it's a pretty much universal phase of life. And I love that this movie engages with it even more than the original uh, film did, where there is very much a sending scene. And it's exactly what I'm describing. It's that ritual of like, we see you, we love you, the world needs you, we affirm that, and you can go out into that. Um, it's such, it's so beautifully written too. Like, mm -hmm. it's gorgeous. It creates a little bit of a sense of resolution as we talked about earlier but still feels unresolved because the way that Miles' mother sees him is still not complete, and we know that, and she doesn't know that. Um, and so, and again, it's digging into these themes, and Gwen's arc is dealing with it too, right? She feels also unseen, and for that reason, there's there's not, um, for the bulk of the movie for her, until she comes back and talks to her dad, there is not that sense of being able to move on from this phase of her life, from this childhood phase of her life. And then she gets her resolution. Um, but we know that Miles still doesn't quite have his. And so I just think it's really beautiful. Again, it's like you're diving into ideas that have been raised in the nature of the character, in the nature of the genre. Um, one thing I do like about the Tom Holland Spider-Mans is that they are also, or at least especially the first one, Homecoming, was very much like about this kind of idea of the youth of the character and the naivety and how you grow from that and then, you know, step out into the world. And so I love that this movie is doing that. And it isn't resolved for Miles yet, but I have every confidence that it will be. And it's complex. Um and what it's going to look like for him in terms of, you know, all the points you were touching on, Alex, is like, is it, does, do we have to have tragedy? Does that have to be a part of our story? Does it have to be a part of the way we define ourselves? I love that, that that's all going to be in the conversation moving forward. Yeah, it's so well done. I'm worried. I'm worried about his mom. They do a lot of character building. I'm so worried about mom. her. And I think that's part of what's really cool about the twist also at the end is that it it could be in a different movie what you're talking about, Trisha. Like he goes and he tells his mom and like he finally, it seems like he finally gets it and like they finally see each other, but it's not his mom twist. And like right. all of that is, it's just really, really well constructed. And as you're saying, sets, tees things up for the next one in a really interesting way. Yeah. Uh, spoilers for the Spider-Man games the, the the playstation games um but miles's dad does die in that story and so i was definitely like watching this going like oh okay i as a non-comics person i know one other miles morales story and that's what happens and then of course they know that we know that that's mm -hmm. what happens right and i think that it's an interesting thing about the sort of the lord and miller verse with like lego movie and mitchell's versus the machines and spider verse is like we know you've seen movies and obviously daniel's with everything everywhere so it's like if if you if we know you know this scene is going to happen in five minutes then we're going to make it happen in 30 seconds or it's not going to happen the way you thought it was going to and also there's 17 things in the background that are more interesting than any other movie you've seen right <laughs> like right. so so it's just like there, there's like constantly pushing pushing this, whether it's narratively or whether it's stylistically, there's just always this pushing of, of, okay, fine. This is how movies are normally made, but you've seen those, right? So now what's next? What do we do from where, where do we go from here? Yeah. Yeah. There's tons more to talk about. Let's move into lessons and keep talking about it in, in lessons. Listener, if you want to talk about it literally with us, uh, every month we have our Patreon film club where our top tier patrons we all get together on Zoom and hang out and talk about a movie. And so our film club for July 
is going to be talking about across the Spider-Verse. So July 1st, usually 10 a.m., uh, we're all going to hang out. So if you want to talk to us about it, head over to the Beyond Screenplay Patreon. Lessons. There's lots more to say. There's, there's so much <laughs> to say. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Brian, what lesson are you going to take away from Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse? So I was thinking watching this movie about what I'm going to call impressionistic storytelling, um, which, you know, the, the one thing I don't even remember what it is. Maybe Alex, you can remember since you saw it twice, but I think, or even someone mentioned it where Gwen is talking to her father in, in that first scene. And like, I don't know, she sighs or something and like pink just kind of wafts across bleeds. the room. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Bleeds. <laughs> um, and I was just thinking, there's so much you can do with the medium of film. And I've talked about this before to make your audience feel what you want them to feel. And so many movies are here are two actors looking at each other, saying words to each other. Right. And that is fine. Like there are plenty of movies where that is great. Uh, stay tuned for more what I'm watching. Um, but I adore whenever a movie, whether it's David Lynch or whether it's an animated movie, whatever, like it can be anything where they're just like, we're going to do something weird and kind of off the cuff because this is the best way to make you feel what we want you to feel right now. Um, and, and this movie was just, is just full of the combination of the style and the music and the pacing and the performances. Um, just everything is constantly making me go. You are making me feel what I want to feel times a thousand. Right. Um, but then to get into like, what is the lesson there? I was just thinking about screenwriting and we have, we unfortunately have, we talked about this in quiet place a little bit. When we talked about the original script uh, of, of a quiet place where it's like, we unfortunately are tied to this. Here is a white page with black text and now make your audience feel what you want them to feel. Right. And so of course we end up just being like, here is dialogue. And then here are some, you know, action lines and, and things to, to kind of do something with that. And there is so much you can do in a screenplay. You know, I, I remember I, in our moonlight episode, I read from the screenplay. I was like, this stuff isn't even, you can't even film this, but it just makes you feel exactly what the, what, what, you know, Barry Jenkins wants you to feel in this moment as you are reading his script. Um, and hopefully that, feeling will will translate to the movie even if the words in the script can't actually translate to the movie um so uh, lesson wise i just think like do everything you possibly can with the text in a script to generate a feeling and to and to communicate a mood to your reader but also there are a lot of these movies there are there are pitch decks and storyboards and Spotify playlists and mood boards and character thing, whatever, you know, it's like, I love playing with any media with Photoshop or, or like a, a Spotify playlist or something to sort of be like, here is the script. And hopefully the script speaks for itself, but I want to do as much as I can to communicate what's in my head to you, the person who is consuming this. So I, I think it is a fun experiment and that might help your script be stronger too, you know? So I just think it's, Whatever you are making, if it is something especially that is that has like a really strong feeling or mood to it, just think about things other than a script you can use to communicate that, but also make your script be as good as possible to try to put all that in there as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because I feel like it's like you're saying, I think, especially if you're an aspiring filmmaker, being able to communicate what's in your head clearly to other people not for better or worse, but essentially, right? Like if what you're picturing uh, isn't good, you want to be able to share that with people and then they can see what you're you're picturing and be like, uh, but, but what about this? And then you can make mm -hmm. it better. Um, and so I think there could be a fear that using other media is like a replacement for story. Sure. And that's right. not what you're saying, right? You're saying right. like those things should be pointed at supporting and amplifying what's good about your story and getting people to understand how it should feel when they're experiencing that story. Exactly. And yeah. that's, yeah, super powerful. Well, because in the case of Across the Spider-Verse, like if you stripped away all of the amazing style, the story is still really good. Exactly. Like right. yeah. the story exactly. is super compelling. So that's why the movie feels dazzling is because it's got the rock solid story right. and on top of that the most amazing animation you've ever seen in your entire life yeah for two hours and 20 minutes yeah yeah <laughs> which yeah. is insane the longest uh american animation film of all time or thus far oh, wow. i think I read. Mm. no complaints no complaints mm -hmm. no yeah 
Uh, awesome. Alex, what's your lesson? Yeah, mine's almost kind of an open-ended question lesson about this part one and part two movies. As we've been talking about a lot in this episode, we have these several examples in recent years. We got we had Dune part one a couple of years ago. We're going to get part two this year, and, and we'll see what that entire thing feels like as one big giant two-part movie. Uh, we're going to have Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning part one uh, in a you know month and a half. And I'm, I'm curious to compare these three examples and see which part ones work the best Um, because part ones are hard of these two parters where you're essentially announcing to the audience in the case of these other two movies, Dune and Dead Reckoning, that this is just a first half of a movie. Um, How do you end those part ones in a way that doesn't feel like a cheat? Um, And, you know, Dune was interesting. We talked about, you know, the, the final scene of that movie being the kind of knife fight and, you know, I, I kind of agree with some of Trisha's, uh, I think Trisha had some perspective from reading the book, but I mean, in the book, there's maybe a clearer rite of passage that killing someone is for Paul Atreides. And in the movie, it just felt like this was another scene, another obstacle overcome. And now we're moving on. And now, oh, Z- Zendaya told me that the movie's over because she said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is just the beginning. Uh, but, but it didn't have the same uh, culmination thematic resonance of the end of this part one in Spider-Verse that I experienced, which which felt like I felt deeply satisfied at the end of mm-hmm. this part one, even though it was also the biggest tease, the biggest cliffhanger possible. Um, so anyway, I'm just excited to compare this to uh, the Reckoning part one and then see how they all pay off in their part twos. And I think we have a really interesting case study. These three right. part one, part twos, all very close together, all dealing with the two-parter thing in different ways. So, yeah, I mean, as Trisha said earlier, it there is something about give me a complete arc, you know. So whether it's Gwen's arc here, whether it's um, Paul's arc in Dune Part One, where we are seeing him sort of go from being this kid to this you know, warrior or whatever, like whatever, uh, whether it's Frodo in fellowship of the ring where like that, the first movie is really about him. Whereas the whole trilogy is about lots of stuff, right? Lots of characters, lots of things going on, but Frodo sort of making this big choice, um, and sort of really committing to it by the end. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see, uh, with like dead reckoning part one, like, are we getting a complete movie or are we getting something that feels like, ah, you didn't actually give me a fully, I think it's going to be a meal of a movie. I'm not yeah. worried about it really, <laughs> yeah. but I, but I do know you mean there are part ones that can feel like we, we, we only made half a movie and not, we made a complete right. movie that is also setting up a part two. Right. I will make a little matrix chart so we can, we, a little, a little graph so we can start putting these movies on there where we feel like they actually go. Including the Sounds matrix good. movies on your matrix. Yeah. matrix of course. Yeah. yeah. The matrix matrix. Also interesting that those three examples all announce themselves as parts in different ways. Mm-hmm. So that can be a part of our conversation also. Like mm-hmm. Some have it in the title, some don't and some right. don't. And then tell you when you're, as soon as you're at the start of the movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Three different ways to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Trisha, what's your lesson? Yeah. I just want to talk about Hobie for a minute. Um, oh, my God. Hobie. Have we not talked about Hobie? So, don't worry. I got you. So uh, good. Yeah. I love Hobie. Um, Daniel Kaluuya's performance. Absolutely <laughs> incredible. I just love Perfect. him so much. I always forget how British he is. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah so yeah. British. Oh, um, but I he plays American characters so well also. I love the animation style, but uh, we often talk about supporting characters like occupying sort of a different thematic place so they can speak into the themes that the central characters are dealing with. And Hobie is perfect for that. And that ends up being a really critical role in this movie. Even though he's playing a very small part, he ends up being a crucial ally. And I can't wait to see what he does in the next part. Um, But, you know, there's a, a... Not even secondary. There's a tertiary theme here about authority, if you will, and like Miguel's authority and why he's getting to call the shots and um, even just this organization of spider people. Um, Like Miguel is making decisions on behalf of basically everyone. Like he has decided that these are the canon events and we can't break them. And those are rules that we have to follow. And Miles, you also have to follow these rules. When you don't follow these rules, bad things happen. I have all of this angst to prove it. Uh, and I'm voiced by <laughs> Oscar Isaac, so you're going to believe me. 
And so like there's this establishment piece to the themes in this in this film um, and into Miles's choice, right? Um, you know, Miguel ends up being a manifestation of those things. But the actual meat of what Miles is dealing with of like, am I going to accept something that I've been told about myself um, and about what options I have or do not have? Um, that's very much the crux of what Miles is dealing with in terms of his identity. And Hobie is here to say, absolutely not. Mm -hmm, right. And it's great. Like, it's just great. And it's mostly played for comedic effect, but it's a thematic counterpoint that's actually really effective. And so I just like that. I love that as a design for the character. Um, it's a really smart way to approach, like, you could have had anybody be, you know, Gwen's maybe other love interest or something. And uh, instead you did something genuinely, I don't know, sort of complicating somebody who actually has uh, something to say in terms of the plot and themes. Um, and yeah, and then becomes of consequence as the story goes on. It's a really smart way to use a supporting character. And he's a great one for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think the tricky thing about a sort of oracle type thing, which is what we really have here with the Spider sure. Society, is like you kind of you kind of are meant to th to believe they know, like they've already done all this work, they've spent thousands of collective spider years, like doing all this and like having all these issues, so they know better than Miles what Miles needs to do with his life, right? But to make them, especially Miguel sort of villainous and sort of sort of you know antagonistic in, in the way that they present themselves and then to have Hobie as somebody who is going like I don't want to I don't buy into that any of this you know what I mean like that you are giving us the audience permission to root for Miles to to want to create his own destiny much like a government Brian I'm just saying where we assume that they work. have all done all the work and they know everything and You're right I, I, you know well, and speaking of supporting characters, I think all of them speak into the theme. Peter B. Parker is an interesting example of he yeah. kind of accepts his tragedy as a necessary stepping stone to get to having a family and having his life that he really loves. And so he wouldn't want to change anything that led to the goodness in his life now. And then you've got the, uh, I've heard his name, the Indian Peter Parker. Um, uh, but, you know, he benefits directly from Miles disobeying the canon also the a canon great event. character yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so so it i i yeah totally agree trisha just like i love that the entire supporting cast is all just so thematically tight it's just it, it just feels so good there's no there's so much like extra stuff in this movie but the but it's all like for fun in the fluff. background right and yeah. the things that are in the foreground all matter a hundred percent and nothing is wasted yeah yeah ellison kind of ties into all all of this which is that I was struck watching this movie um, that at every moment I was aligned with Miles, even when he was uh, wrong, I'm going to say, or like, essentially, I think the lesson is get the audience aligned with your protagonist, even when they're in their old world, even when they're holding on to like the wrong beliefs, like mm -hmm. be with them on every step of that journey. And this movie, as we've talked about, uses every single tool to your point, Brian, uh, and all the supporting characters, like everything, every moment it is making you feel what it wants you to feel like no moment is less important than the next moment. And so when Miles is fighting Spot and he's like, you're just the villain of the week. Everything that's being done in the execution is making me feel like, yeah, that is a villain of the week. This is going to be a fun little like intro fight and then we're going to go on to the real thing and then the movie does that right the movie did that on purpose miles gets to his meeting with his parents but then spot continues and miles is like wait a minute that's not supposed to happen and i'm feeling like wait a minute that's not supposed to happen mm -hmm. uh and that i think if you can get the audience to go on every step of the journey and not take any moment for granted because i feel like that's you know i saw ant-man versus quantum mania or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I enjoyed it uh -huh. overall. I, I enjoyed it and like cool work was done on it. 
but there is a certain amount of like, this scene's going to happen and it's going to tell you that this is what you're feeling now. And then the next scene is going to tell you how to feel. And it's sort of just like connecting the dots a little bit slow and slow. And this movie doesn't take any of that for granted. It makes every moment of every scene important to you and invested in that so that the twists and the emotional turns and the theme are actually impactful such that when Miles says, nah, I'm going to do me, I'm cheering because like, yeah, Yeah. like, yes, individualism. You stand up for yourself. No one can tell you what to do. And then when he's face to face with dark Miles and is realizing, oh, maybe this is more complicated. I'm also in that moment, like as uh, feeling that turn and that predicament as much as possible. So, yeah, it's a hard lesson to like point, like put a finger on, but just don't take any moment for granted like people are gonna sit there and watch the whole thing you hope so make every moment as powerful and palpable and visceral and take people on that ride and put them in alignment with the characters in your story theme theme do a theme do a theme, do a theme and care about it and make sure it's in yeah. every frame of yeah. the- and i'm so excited about that theme also because i think that's yeah. as we're talking about, like where do you go like now that he's face to face with the consequences of I'm going to do me, what do you do? And that's just, right. that's great. It's a, it's a choice. It's a character revealing choice that we're going to get to see. And it's very excited. What else have you guys been watching recently? Trisha, what have you been watching recently? I'm so glad you asked. I sat down and watched 65, which is the Beck and Woods Adam Driver versus the Dinosaurs. Movie. Oh my God, this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the Somebody original watched it. script of The Quiet Place. <laughs> yes, I did. It was me. I watched it. Um, <laughs> you know, I actually really wished you guys had seen it. I mean, Adam Driver lands on Earth uh, by accident. He is an actually an alien from another world. Um, human, but not human. He's an alien from another world. Um, so it's not he, time travel. He's actually just from no. A it's not time place. travel. No, oh, okay. he's from a totally different planet. And his ship crash lands on Earth, and uh, it's him. And there's only one other survivor from that. Um, and it's a young woman, um, and she does. She's a girl, really, and she doesn't speak the same language as him because she's from a different place on his home world than he is. And they have to get from where they crash to the top of a mountain to, like, send a signal for rescue. And meanwhile, uh, they're on Earth, and it's 65 million years ago, so there's a lot of dinosaurs. That's the movie. (laughs) Here's the thing. (laughs) It's kind of great in the sense that it's an incredibly simple premise. And there's a lot about the execution that's really clever. um, Because... Similar to A Quiet Place, you have really, really clever writing that looks at the constraints of a budget and the constraints of what you can believably do um, in a certain amount of time with a certain amount of money and wants to push those constraints out to the furthest edges of their ambition. And there's a lot that actually kind of works about it because it's smart, like I don't want to get too much into it, but for example, the choice I mentioned where he and and this girl don't speak the same language becomes of, you know, real conflict and real problems um, and also keeps the story from like straying into um, goofiness. I mean, it's still very goofy, but it would be a lot goofier, right? It like there's a grounding to a lot of the choices and I don't know if you just want like a really fascinating example of how to make what should be like a $200 million movie for a quarter of that cost, you know, 65 is your movie. And I don't know. uh, I had a lot of fun watching it. So you can rent that. It's on a number of streaming services now. Uh, Yeah. 65. Nice. Okay. It's quite a premise. I like it. (laughs) Alex, what have you been watching recently? So I've watched it a couple times now, but I missed it during Oscar season. Uh, but I finally watched Tar, uh, starring oh, Kate Blanchett. I did too. And Ooh, guys. man, 
I Ooh. really liked it. Like I found it to be such a fascinating movie that I, it was like slow, but so captivating and so interesting. And it's kind of like almost like sterile objectivity, but it's also very kind of intense. Uh, and just Kate Blanchett is just, she's like an alien, like God person. <laughs> like, I don't know how she's so good. <laughs> like she's good at acting. Um, as I said, she's really Twitter. good. Yeah. Just like the way she could embody this character, like so fully is mind blowing. And yeah, just, it, it reminded me that, you know, Todd Field's last movie was little children, which was like 13 years ago or something now. And I also loved that movie. Um, and I just think he's a really interesting filmmaker that likes to kind of brush up against really gnarly, thorny subjects and kind of controversial ideas, but brushes up against those things in the most like smart and kind of fascinatingly objective way, just kind of presenting like presenting the audience with just like some things and it's kind of up to you to like deal with it. <laughs> and like, what about, what mm -hmm. do I, what do I do with all this? Um, and little children, I think did that as well with some really kind of controversial sub subjects. So yeah, tar, I, I can't like recommend it to like any random person because a lot of people I know just turned it off. Cause they were like, what the hell is this movie? Um, but I just found it to be really fascinating and yeah, it's, it's like it's like shot like a horror movie. I don't know. There's so much going on and I just can't stop thinking about it. So, yeah, I did tar. also yeah. ultimately <laughs> love it. I thought about Brian and Trisha. I think you guys are sort of saying like a little too long. First half better. Something to that effect. And I was feeling that where like it does get long. And the second half, I think, is not as captivating. But the first half, I was like, I'm watching a 20 minute real time interview with Kate Blanchett yeah, playing New a character Yorker interview and yeah. I am <laughs> loving it like I want <laughs> this to go on forever uh so I was really into it also uh, but that's not my thing so we'll get to that later Brian <laughs> what have you been watching recently um I've been watching a lot of sort of second tier in terms of how well they're known Hitchcock movies. Um, so I saw for the first time Suspicion, Marnie, Dial M for Murder, To Catch a Thief, and Notorious. Whoa! Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, most of them in a theater, which, which is always <laughs> great. That's cool. um, and they're all great. I recommend them all. Marnie is wild. Uh, Trisha? No, I was just going to say, um, yeah, I'm so curious what you're going to pick as like your favorite one of that batch. <laughs> oh, okay. I have a, I have a clear Is favorite. Is it Dial M for Murder? It is. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> Based on my earlier comment of you can just have people talking in a room and it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted, I just want to shout out Marnie as, as probably the worst of these five, but it is such a bizarre acid trip of a bananas movie with Sean Connery and Tippi Hedren. And it's, it's like this weird B movie. <laughs> sometimes it's brilliant and sometimes it's just like, it's so campy. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, Style M for Murder is easily one of like a top five Hitchcock for me, if not a top three. Uh, it's Grace Kelly. Her husband find out she's having an affair and he plots to have her killed. And it's based on a play. So 90% of the, the movie takes place in their apartment and characters come and they go. And every scene is so compelling and well paced and you're just like you just can't wait for the next thing to happen and oh is they are they they're gonna see that thing that thing is right there and someone might see it and oh, you know you're just like constantly in this total state amazing midpoint that then now you're like well now what's the rest of the movie going to be um and so satisfying too like it was just uh suspicions a really great movie where the the studio didn't let hitchcock keep the ending and i think the ending would have been awesome and the ending that's there is like, ah, it's fine. But Dial in for Murder is like everything that you want to happen happens exactly in the way you want it to happen. So absolutely. I'm so sold. On, yeah, absolutely. Check yeah, it out. I got to see and, it. And any of the others do. I need to see it again. I saw it a long, long time ago and remember mm -hmm. liking it. But I remember nothing. But as you're talking, it's like coming back to me. And I, was like, hey, I should watch that again. That's good. Definitely should. Yeah. Nice. But what have you been watching, Michael? Well, Ted Lasso recently oh. ended season three happened i didn't know season three was the last season 
uh, until the last episode, just before the last it's episode. It still officially is not. So <laughs> right. we'll see. But they really? pretty much... They, it yeah. would be silly for them to try to do a fourth season in the, in the <laughs> right. conventional, you know, what you think of when you hear that. Um, but like Ted Lasso is just, it's such an interesting outlier in so many ways in terms of like the content that is made and there's so much hype when it came out and people are like oh it's the best thing ever you will like it you will love it you do not have a choice and i did really enjoy it and season two went to some interesting places there was a, a little like feeling in the back of my head the whole time where it's like like this is good but like it's not as good as everyone's saying like there's some i mean i like it but like everyone calm down season three for whatever reason just hit me exactly right like it feel it felt to me like thank you they <laughs> why is everybody like saying it sucks on twitter i know wait, wait, <laughs> Every, really? everybody like th- yes. i thought everybody hated it based yeah, off just like been... online reactions oh my not that yeah. well received oh my yeah i am stunned i've seen yeah. like headlines and articles of like ted lasso is just like really you know ruined itself in this last season i give up yeah. on humanity then i don't yeah. know because yeah. i feel like this season was <laughs> like great and important and such a a good model of how to do a progressive 21st century show with like modern it felt like a kid show but for adults in like the best mm-hmm. possible way of like <laughs> yeah oh i can watch a story that isn't cynical and has like is putting generous good things out into the world and i can enjoy it and not like it doesn't make fun of it's like i don't know it was just like nailing modern morality in a way that felt genuine and sincere and thoughtful and i don't know i just like i loved it it felt like important viewing that made me feel better as a human afterward and not like yeah this does validate my cynical like way of life so i don't know i yeah i can't say enough about it i really really (laughs) liked it and i feel like it's another that sincerity and caring about every single moment i think it's also kind of what i was trying to say about uh across the spider verse of like care enough that you're telling me your your story you're not just doing your story at me but like tell me a story and bring me in and i feel like ted lasso i don't know this season i thought was amazing so so there twitter your net is wrong yeah. nice yeah. <laughs> would not be the first time internet my opinion is objective fact <laughs> cool well so this has been the beginning of our summer season, our summer impossible season, talking about Across the Spider-Verse. There is so much more to say. We're looking forward to talking to you patrons about it in the film club. Uh, And if you are not a patron, this summer season is a great time to join because like we said, there's the Mission Impossible 2 Discord watch along that we're gonna have, which is gonna be really, really fun. One of our patron exclusives uh, is gonna be on either Elemental (laughs) or Asteroid City. Patrons are deciding that. And then, of course, after going through the entirety of the Mission Impossible franchise, it culminates with a patron exclusive about Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, which is going to be I'm very excited about. Um, <laughs> and of course, after that, we have uh, don't leave the biggest out. Well, yes, head That will be for everyone. But yeah. patrons get to decide which are, are we, are we going to talk about Barbie or are we going to talk about Oppenheimer? You get to decide. There can only be one. There yeah. can only be one. I love how legendary this this competition this is. Out. Just like Woo. online, just the discourse about Barbie versus Oppenheimer is just. <laughs> uh, as of this uh, recording, the vote is really close. I was so. going to say, it is not a blowout in either direction. I just yeah. need you guys to know your vote matters. It is very yes. close. The vote is open Who's now. Who's ahead as of right now? It is Barbie. It but is Barbie. By a very a slim bit. margin. So, if you want to, if you want to move the dial on that, head over to the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon <laughs> and make your voice heard. Democracy, <laughs> the most important vote of all time. Of all time, it is. we want you. <laughs> Thank you, as always, to our patrons for making the show possible. Thank you to our producer, Vince Major, and our editors, Donovan Bullum, Caleb Berg, Graham Harther, and Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker, and I'm joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. All of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet and say hi, and we will see you in the next episode for Mission Impossible. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.